Okay, first of all. Cheers. So happy to Salute. be here with you. Salute. Get I'm, to your both cheeks now. Oh, so I am Laura Daniel, and welcome to Laura Loves New York. And I am here with the world-renowned playwright, Joe Gullick. I am so happy to be here right now. <laughs> Joe has won countless awards for his work, and he has an upcoming show of The Bronx Queen at 54 Below on December 27th at 9.30. The arrival here is better than the interview already because no one could ever... It was like The Amazing Race it. and Survivor wrapped up in one. I hadn't been to the Bronx in forever, so when I called Joe and said, I'm on the Grand Concourse, he laughed because it's huge. He picked me up, we drove to Arthur Avenue, and we arrived at our destination of Dominic's. I'd like to call you on the carpet. Okay. First, your show is called Laura Loves New York. Yes. Some forget that the Bronx and the other boroughs are part of New York. Yes, yes. So when you beautifully invited me to do this, I said, I have to represent. You do. I have to represent, <laughs> and I wanted to introduce you to my world, my I'm Bronx. I'm so glad you did. Yeah. I've known Joe for years. I mean, it I would feels say. like yesterday, but I think it's going. Probably ten years. Ten years. Oh my God. Yeah. So I met Joe because I was called in for an audition for one of his plays. My director, Brian Rarden, um, was helping me. It was the first full-length play I ever wrote. <laughs> And I remember him saying, I have a girl for you. And I was like, and it was interesting for me because I wasn't that involved in the New York theater scene because I had been away. And I was like, oh, who? And he said, she's a great actress. She's very beautiful. And I said, cool. And so it was really neat that you came referred. <laughs> I was for thank you, Brian. You thank you very much. <laughs> and I mean, you were not cast. But the, the main reason was that character, although I know you're a great actress, was particularly dark. <laughs> and your Joe's characters are very specific, and that's one of the things I love about your work. The human experience has some dark crevices, and you shine the light on them. And that's, you know, that's, I really love that. I'm going to take that compliment. I mean, you've taught me some lessons by accident, and, and good lessons because you're such a fun person. Now you're a friend. <laughs> you're great to have in the room, as they say, which is important to me mm -hmm. to have. It's a dream when you can cast talented people who you also want to hang out with. The cool thing that came out of the audition was a really fantastic, interesting friendship. <laughs> oh, and here comes our car food. Wow. Every interview should be should have exactly like, like this. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. Much. And I made a big drama about the fact that I have to have the big clams at Dominic. I'm super excited. I said it like 14 times. <laughs> so Charlie, the no. owner of Dominic's, came over and he's he's gonna tell us all about Dominic. First he sent the wine. You did. This is the Dominic's brand wine. It's delicious by the way. And you were saying it should be because it's actually it's Italian wine. Thank you. It, it's a it's a Pinot Grigio that comes from Italy. They bottle it in Italy, they label it for me, and it's, it's, my, it's Dominic's Pinot Grigio. It's Thank you very much. Joe, Seriously. great to see you. Oh my God. I've been here about 30 something years. My father-in-law and Uncle Dominic, my Uncle Dominic, started the place in 1962. And I came into the business later. I kept it going. And it's real comfort food. And that's what we build on. It's all fresh food from the neighborhood. If you talk about Italian, Italian food in the Bronx, the first thing you think of is Dominic. And Charlie is always there. Never in a bad mood, always hosting the place, hosting sing-alongs in the park during Christmas time. I mean, people want to be able to say, I know Charlie. Oh, Laura loves New York audience. They all know Charlie now, so you're in trouble. This is a celebrity moment for you, Charlie. <laughs> Thank you. The restaurant is beautiful with a beautiful bar. There's two floors of dining, and it is old school Italian seating where you sit right next to each other. And the, the food, oh my god, the food is amazing. And this is such a family oriented place. It's just like, wow. So we Jen, came here when I was a kid. We, I grew up in a fully Italian neighborhood. Everybody was Italian. I, you know, there was one or two. Irish people. So you were born in the Bronx? Born in the Bronx. Morris Park Avenue. And the funny thing is, is that Joe was saying, we're not filming in, in his I know. We're not filming no, in your neighborhood. I'm nervous. <laughs> I will, people, there will be comments. <laughs> I will hear about this. But there's the little Italy of the Bronx, I think, inarguably, is Arthur Avenue, where we are. 
that my father was born in this neighborhood. So we had to make the pilgrimage at least once a month. So we had to come and we passed by his apartment, which is down the block, see where, you know, he fell down the stairs, all these stories. And then we come to Dominic's, which is this restaurant. Normally it's a zoo. They sat you with other people all the time. It freaked me out because you'd be here eating. Like I'd be eating like my own spaghetti. And there would be like a lady I don't know would lean over and say, oh, are you finished with that? And take it and eat it. And then they'd get up. And then what you learn when you come here, you learned already. There's no menu. Our lovely waiter told us everything on the menu that night. And then at the end of your meal, he just tells you the total of what you owe. Right. It's a very unique place. I love and it's it. delicious. It is so good. I'm not really oh a foodie, but I really wanted the baked clam. It's I will so be good. eating them continuously <laughs> to the interview. And cheers. Yeah. <laughs> when did you know that you wanted to be an actor? When did I allow myself to believe I wanted to be an actor is really the question. <laughs> but I was that kid who wanted to be in the play in kindergarten and was. And then in like sixth grade, directed and produced the play. You know, I, I would start writing plays in the neighborhood. So even though I wasn't really fully admitting to myself I wanted to be an actor or in the entertainment industry, I just naturally was positioning myself for it. So I asked Joe how he developed the career he has now. I didn't really write anything until I returned from Rome, and that was right before I met you. And the only reason why I wrote it was, I lived in Rome for three years, that's another story, but I was in Rome, involved in an, what I call, and what was, an unrequited love affair. It was so painful. But it had the backdrop of Rome, so even though it was unrequited and painful, I was in beautiful locations, and you know, I was, if I was sad, I was near the Tiber River crime. The woman, whose role you tried out for, had always said during it, this is a play. Like what you're going through and the way you're going through it is a play. And that play became Garbo. Again, it was easy for me to write that play because all I did was write dialogues. I wrote a dialogue between the girl and me, me complaining and crying about the guy. And then I write a dialogue about the fun I was having with the guy, whatever. And so I had a play. And I, I looked on the internet for like where you submit plays I never had, put a stamp on that thing, sent it. And then literally two days later, the Fresh Fruit Festival, which is pretty reputable in Manhattan, accepted my play. And two <laughs> seconds later, I was, I had written, I was starring in, and I was producing, this is why I met you, my first play. Oh my god, I'm I, I am just, I am blown away. I am blown away. It's unbelievable that it happened naturally, that it got accepted so easily, and that it happened, and it was, it was beautiful. That original Garbo got me a major feature editorial and out magazine. Like some of my dreams came, I was like being interviewed. The Downtown Urban Arts Festival hosted a full production of Garbo and the Bronx Queen. I want to hear about the Bronx Queen. Okay, yes. It looks amazing. I have to, how did that happen? So I see this ad. Um, they were, it was a United Solo Festival at Theater Row. Ah. I had never done anything like that, although I was a fan of Spalding Gray. And I always thought it was fascinating that he sat behind the desk and told stories and that that was what he did. He challenged myself to want to do it, but never knew how or why I would. And in my family, in my larger family at larger events, I always told stories you know, about things that happened in our family. And there were favorites ones that people really laughed at the most. It's like, Joe, you have to tell the story tell about grandma. Story yes. You know what I mean? And so, <laughs> so I would rank them. I, I knew the ones that were the, you know, that people liked. And there was about 10. I, I said, you know what? I'm gonna get up and just tell 10 of those stories. I also always knew my father, because he was fearful that I was gonna be gay, would take me on a fishing boat in the Bronx to go fishing to be manly. And the name of the boat was the Bronx Queen. Oh my God! And I always crazy. found it so ironic and ridiculous that my father was trying to man, make a man out of me by taking me on a boat called the Bronx Queen. And so I was like, wow. and so I researched the history of the boat, and the boat sunk, and some people died. 
So I'm oh like, ooh, this, there's a story. So I juxtapose the story of the Bronx Queen, the boat, and the Bronx Queen, Joe Gola. And I sat down to write it. And as I wrote it, it's gonna sound so corny. It was like, you know what they say when they say like someone's yep. moving your hand? Yep. It was more than the stories. They started to fold into each other. It became this deeper, serious, poetic thing. I was in love with it. I thought this is something I would want to see, but that didn't mean anyone else would care. But I performed it, Spalding Gray style. And that has had momentum. I mean, I won a lot of awards for it. It's always sold out. I did it at United Solo for a few years and I broke records there. Uh, and then I sent it to the Downtown Urban Arts Festival. They accepted it and they, they said their venues were, if you got accepted, Joe's Pub and or Cherry Lane Theater. Both were like wow. dreams of mine yep. to like perform it. Oh my God. But for me at that moment, it was Joe's Pub. But I couldn't imagine why they would choose a non-singer to perform there. But I said to them, I believe I could sell it out. I believe it will work. And they really trusted me and they let me perform in the festival, but at Joe's Pub. I got all the bells and whistles of any celebrity or anyone that would perform there. Well, it's so fitting, Joe's Oh my God, of course. I worked all that angle. I worked every angle possible. Yes, I used every joke. You're wonderful at, I don't want to say marketing, but you are really good at how you create your I have a PR background. Ah, PR background. When I was sitting in college, because I was afraid to admit I was an artist, I took communications and majored in PR. And when I worked in PR, I said, what am I ever going to use this for? <laughs> You've used it a lot. All the time. You've got to follow Joe. He's on um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Mm -hmm. And it's all on her. At I Joe Gullah. At Joe Gullah. Yeah. Joe also performed his solo shows Daddy and Faggy 50 at Joe's Pub. Oh my God, no, there's, this great, there's this great play called Sleeping with the oh, Fish. Yeah. I love it, I love it. Yes. I got to do a reading of it, at the, lovely in it. at the LGBTQ community, which yes. is so fun. And Joe likes to cast me as these sort of like crazy little New York ladies. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we wanted you in it. We wanted oh you to God, be in it. It was so fun. Yes. But it's such a great love story. Yeah. There, you you take these unlikely or very tough guy characters and really show the love. Literally, was a month ago. I was in Milan, Italy. You know, Italy, where my grandparents immigrated from, receiving a playwriting award for my gay play, Sleeping with the Fish, in a beautiful piazza with all these strangers, you know, these Italian people, my people, you know, clapping for me and laughing at, you know, the show and what it was about and what it meant. And it was very profound to me to have that experience. I mean, it really is the stuff dreams are made of. Yeah. We're I'm making a film of it right now. Are they really? Yes. Oh, I thought I saw you post that. Yes. Awesome. yes. Well, okay, so speaking of film, like you <laughs> have this really fun shot in a, in a music video. Yes. And oh, yeah. I love First of all, I love the thought of being in a music video. And you know, we want you to be you know, the guy that opens the door during the video. I want I want and so I said, yeah, of course I'll do it. You know what we want. And then I really didn't know what he saw in me. We want it all. We want more. Only to realize he saw me as a true, down and dirty, New York, New York. Italian. I was oddly complimented that that's how he saw me. And it's me screaming out my childhood window the way my parents did. It went, that's hilarious. It's fully hilarious. That's awesome. I love it. I, I gave it my best Danny Aiello. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I want more. Of course so, I don't picture myself that way, but of course no, it's but, no, but suited me You're an actor and you're able me to do fine. It. Yeah. So tell me about the deuce. How did that how did that come oh. about? Ego and fantasy and whatever. So <laughs> I heard there was so a show weird. on HBO that was coming called The Deuce about the porn industry in the seventies and I'm a gay man of a certain age, as I call myself. 
And I was like, oh my God, I was there. You know what I mean? Like, I was there. And the thought of just being in that world and being a gay man in that world, because I was pre aid you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really, I didn't care what I would have to do. So before season two ever came, I was writing letters and said, I need to be on the show, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, it, there were minor roles, but I don't care. I'm in the gay bar scenes, which was thrilling. It really was. Because, because again, I sat there and realized these were men who did not know what was about to happen. Yeah. I can almost cry saying that. But the fun and the joy of that, you know what I mean, I, I was able to feel for that. So I, I enjoyed that. So then um, season three jumps ahead a bit and they cast me as the Danny, you know, like a gangster type. That's so it was fantastic. So now it was 80s. And I mean, I enjoyed the 80s quite a lot. Yes. I mean, the costumes they put on me, I was like, I, I literally wore these clothes. And the other actors who were younger were like, oh, look at this. I'm like, I had that shirt. I had this shirt. The Deuce was such a great fit for Joe because he had written a collection of plays called Gay Porn Mafia. Sounds so promo, but I am performing at 54 Below, and as a kid, I was dying to get into Studio 54, which I did eventually succeed, but still, I was never on the marquee, you know what I mean? Okay, so that's how, yeah. The story of getting into Studio 54, how did As you a kid? Get, how did you get in there? Lord. Well, now I can give away some of the secrets, but I would do anything. Okay, one, I mean, <laughs> many different ways, but one of the famous ways was you go down the block, I would get a limo that was already brought somebody in, give them $20, they would drive to the front, we would walk in one door and out the other. So it appeared though as you were arriving in the limo. Oh my God. That's and that's really all you needed with those kind of crowd pickings. They always went for the new thing. So if you were coming out of a limo and your outfit was okay, they were like, you know, they loved having people walk past the crowd. Wow. This is in my show, The Bronx Queen, too. Like, uh, I couldn't believe I was reading in the papers. See this I couldn't believe oh, this was happening nearby. Like, all the uh, anti war, all oh, these artists, you know, celebrities were at this club during the disco. I mean, I loved, you know, the radio was playing disco. Okay, did you ever meet Andy Warhol? I'm curious. I never met Andy Warhol. I did meet someone else, but I'm not going to give it away because it's a plot point in and The Bronx Queen. You got to see this play. But I was watching a documentary about that time. And the documentary with a lot of regular footage, and I looked, and it's me with two major player artists of the era, one being Andy Warhol. Wow. I couldn't freaking, I mean, I would love to have met Andy Warhol. Of course. Oh my God. I did meet the other one, and that's a tease. And that's it, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, gotta yeah. come see a show. But, December 27th at 54 Below. Yeah. And it's sure to be a fun night. So I always end my, my interviews with, if you had any advice that you would give your younger self, what would it be? Yeah. So it's going to sound weird at first, but if I truly had that invitation and the ability to say something to my younger self, I would say, don't wait for permission. And I, I blame Catholicism on this. I blame, you know, being, you know, a good son, a good student, that I always sort of felt to not trust my instincts, that that was something wrong with that. And, that, you know, as a gay man, too, especially then, you know, it's like something's wrong with my actual reality, you know, so am I allowed to do that? I think a lot more would have happened sooner if I didn't wait for permission. And I have to imagine, as I do, as a writer and a performer, that if one person's feeling that way, there's a lot of others that feel that way. I would definitely say to my younger self, and I'd, and I'd love to say to anyone I was able to, don't just, just do it. Trust your instincts. Yeah. I, you know, and I don't know if this is inappropriate, but did it take you long to come out? Was it hard to come out? That's a fun question. Because and I, and I, don't I feel like, well, I came out when I was 22, right? That was, for the time, I was kind of right on schedule a little bit early because I had some closer friends that came out earlier. That's great. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that helped. So, would I love to have been that person just for fun's sake to have, like, brought a guy to my senior prom? Yes. So, in that sense, I feel like it was late. But if I had done, I mean, if I had, well, who knows what I would have been if I had done that because that was not something that's going to happen in the Bronx at my yeah. Catholic high school, you know, do at you, all. Do you feel that, that, that there's been progress for, for the LGBT? Yes, yes. Oh, my God. I mean, yes.
I am cynical still, but meaning I have to, so the answer is yes, there's gay marriage. I mean, that's blatant. There's, you know, some of the conversations I hear with younger gay, you know, kids or younger men, they've had an easier time of it. It's more, quotes, normal and they're more comfortable. So I love hearing that or whatever, but it frightens me a little bit because I don't think the work is done, as they yeah. say, yeah. and it's still a blatant issue. I know many examples, my age, younger, whatever, of people that still need, to, you know, to, that guidance, that comfort, that more to happen, or, I mean, it's the work is not done. And I don't, I never thought I would be Larry Kramer-ish, ever. You know what I mean? Ever. Although in my, one of my recent short plays, I was, I did a whole Larry Kramer speech, and I, might end up becoming a, a curmudgeon that starts screaming about stuff like that, but not yet. <laughs> but not yet, because I want people to come and see my plays and I'd be like, oh, that screaming maniac person. No, and again, I'm going to go back to, I think that you're really good at shining the light into, into dark places. I will take that compliment. It's really, really important. I do try to do that. What, when I'm preaching, I try to do it in my style. And your, yes. your humor is delicious. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, you guys have noticed just Joe's delicious humor. Let me to shine the light on you a little bit. I love you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you so for having me. God. I am such a reluctant producer. I do produce. I think I do a decent job of it you when do. I do it. You do. But to put something like this together, I give you major credit, by the way. And I think it's wonderful. The fact that you want to talk to artists, that you want to expose artists to other people, mm-hmm. you want to have conversations like this. Oh my God. So you're doing work that I think is really, really, really great. And I love that. These, you're my tribe, you know? No, and I love that. And that's something I do want to say. I'm proud with all the things I suggested tonight about my trepidations, about admitting I was an artist, and you know, coming out of that closet, and other other closets that I'm loving where I'm at, that I am an artist, I can have these conversations, I can create pieces that are worth talking about, and I can meet and talk to other artists like that. These are just the dream come true. And if we can do it while eating baked clams and (laughs) shrimp crunches, and people are going to send over bottles of wine, why not? Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for being on my show. Again, please, please check out Joe online. He has so much wonderful stuff. And go see his show, The Bronx Queen, December 27th at 9.30 at 54 below. Ah! I'm hugging you. I'm hugging you. <laughs> I love you, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. Thank you I love you. All right, Laura guys. loves New York. I love Laura. And I love Joe. All right, bye, you guys. Bye. bye.